Okay, well I'll crack on straight away. Thank you very much for turning up and thank you all of you who are watching in your offices and various other places around the university. As Denise said, I'm from the Natural Resources Institute and our strap line is Knowledge to Feed the World. We're essentially an agricultural organisation and just to give you a brief introduction to the Institute, we were originally part of uh, an imperial institute uh, in the 19th century and then became part of the Ministry of Overseas Development, which is essentially the British government's development wing. And we had three institutes that operated under the um, ministries of the Ministry of Overseas Development. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, and this um, this was in existence until this was in existence until 1988, when we were amalgamated into a single institute down in Chatham, where we are now. And then in 1996, the ownership transferred to the University of Greenwich. So we're now actually an institute part of the university. So we have a lot of training programs as part of our activities, which is a great, which is a great um, thing for us. So, okay, we've got this. Okay. okay, so the mission of the Natural Resources Institute is to discover, apply, and share knowledge in support of global food security, sustainable development, and poverty reduction. We're not just a development organisation, we're interested in food security in all parts of the world. And our expertise lies in having a multidisciplinary centre for research, advisory work, consultancy, teaching and training. We have 60 professional staff, both natural scientists and social scientists, and we now have between 50 and 60 PhD students and about 80 MSc students. So we don't do any undergraduate teaching, or very much undergraduate teaching, most of it's graduate stuff. Yes, so currently we're operating in various uh, parts of the world. This gives you an, an overview of the kind of work that we're doing, and these are where we're active at the moment. I don't know. Okay. Um, okay. uh, so we currently have uh, activities in Europe, uh, in Asia, in Australia. Most of our activities are actually going on in Sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, we also have some activities in Ecuador. And uh, of course, the current project, which I'm going to talk a little bit about, in Trinidad. Um, we have about, currently about 150 projects which are a, a value which are valued between about 100,000 and about 10 million US dollars. Our main donors are Gates, uh, the EU, and various government agencies. So we currently have about 150 projects going live at the moment, and we are have a very global reach. So let me start talking about the work I've uh, come to talk to you about today. So why are plants such great chemists? Well, one of the main reasons is because they've been doing it a lot longer than us. If you think about how long. Humans have been making chemicals, it's about 70 years successfully, whereas plants have been doing it for well over 70 million years. So they obviously have a head start, and perhaps we'll be catching them up in that kind of time frame. But if we, if we look at some of the ecology of the plants, we'll start to understand why they are such sophisticated uh, synthetic chemists, or biosynthetic chemists. Don't uh, worry too much about the chemical structures I'm going to show you throughout the talk. You don't need to necessarily understand chemistry to understand how they work. This is just a slide to give you an idea of the variation in chemistries that plants can produce. We have various groups of compounds, flavonoids, terpenoids, amines, alkaloids, uh, and essential oils. And the diversity of chemical structures is really quite bewildering. But the numbers is also quite astounding. We know for sure that we have around 10,000 flavonoids, about 20,000 terpenoids, maybe 20,000 alkaloids. We estimate that there are perhaps somewhere in the region of 100,000 different chemical structures produced by plants, and there are about 300,000 plants. So for every three plants, you've got a new chemical structure, which is pretty astonishing, really. So, why do they produce such an array of chemicals? Well, one of the most obvious ways plants show their chemical diversity is in their colours. Most of you will be familiar with the um, huge variety of colours you get from flowers, of course, the main colour that plants produce is chlorophyll, and of course this could arguably be described as a primary metabolite. Uh, beta carotene is a very important component, but you'll see that it's a very different structure to many of these other colour compounds. It's very important for telling animals that a fruit is ripe and ready to eat, and therefore ready to disperse the seeds. Of course, most colours we're familiar with through the colours in flowers. Vial delphin here, which is a um, hugely complex structure based on a procyanidin, and again, anti-ryanin here, which is also a pro and pro-cyanidin. 
uh, structure which colours flowers here and here. So colours are an obvious way in which plants need to have variety and of course one of the main reasons for this is of course they need to garner pollinator fidelity, they need to be attractive to pollinators. So this huge array of colours, one of the main purposes is to attract pollinators. Plants are pretty clever as well, they can even call for help. So if a plant is under attack, it can actually emit chemicals that actually attract other animals that will feed on the insect that's doing the attacking. So in this particular case, we've got two chemical structures here, 6 methyl 5 heptan 2 own and linalool, which are two examples of chemicals that are released by plants when they're attacked by aphids. And these chemicals are attractive to aphidius ervi, this parasitic wasp, which then locates the insects and lays eggs in it. So it's essentially a plant using its chemistry skills to call in the troops to get some help defending itself. And this is actually stems from this basic premise. The one problem plants have compared to animals is they can't run away. So we've got a gazelle here doing as best a job it can getting away from this lion. Of course the equivalent in the plant world might be this caterpillar, but there's no way this plant's going anywhere. So it has to find some other way of defending itself. And it's perhaps in this sphere that we find the greatest diversity and the greatest purpose for secondary metabolites or plant chemicals in the plant kingdom. And of course they have to fight off not just insects, but diseases, fungal diseases, bacterial diseases, and even viral diseases. So they're faced with these challenges all the time and they can't escape them, they have to deal with them where they are. And so this brings me on to the first subject I'd like to talk about in terms of the research we're doing. I'm going to try and cover four areas of work will give you some idea of how we're trying to exploit this chemical diversity in plants to try and use it for agricultural purposes, or at least to improve ecosystems. So in this particular case, we've got the example of the sweet potato. Um, it's attacked by this insect here. It's a, uh, an insect called Silas. In Africa, there are two species, Silas puncticolis and Silas bruneus, and it produces these holes and feeding holes, it lays its eggs in the, in the skin and the larvae burrow in and of course they reduce the harvestable product. Both adults and larvae feed on the roots and the damage reduces the quality as well as the yield. So when they've burrowed, it actually, the effects actually spread by taste throughout the product. And this of course impacts on food security and family income. And of course being a subterranean crop it's very difficult to control with insecticides. So what we've done, we've tried to look at natural resistance, basically using what the plants might do themselves to protect themselves, to try and find a way of addressing this pest problem. So we set up field trials. This is work that's been going on in Uganda for several years now. We've set up field trials. Different plots are actually different uh, cultivars. Um, we've got a great gene pool there. We actually tested over 100 um, cultivars, and I'll show you some data from about 40 of them. And after about 90 days, we infested them artificially with the pest insects. So they all had the same infestation at the beginning of the process. And it takes about five months for these plants to start producing the root. And here's a dendrogram that shows the clustering of the resistance. And down here, we've got the susceptible varieties. These are varieties we found that were actually susceptible. Um, if we go up, we'll find that we found a largish group here in the middle that were, that were fairly tolerant, the damage levels were significant, but they were much less than we were getting in the susceptible varieties. And then at the top, we actually found quite a large number of varieties that we considered to be resistant. So we chose to look specifically at two susceptible varieties called Tanzania and Naspot 1. These suffered 46 and 62% damage and also a resistant variety here, Nukawoga, which suffered less than 5% damage. So you'll see the scale of resistance and susceptibility here. So we set up some simple laboratory bioassays. We first of all did them with roots that were undamaged, and we found that these replicated what we were getting with these root plugs. We use these root plugs because they're a little easier to monitor and manage. We've got a fixed surface area that we're exposing the insects to. And in this setup, we tested Tanzania, the susceptible variety, against Nukawoga, the resistant variety, and showed that in the, in the susceptible variety, over a 24-hour period, we had many more feeding holes than in the resistant variety, 
we had more eggs laid than in the resistant variety, and we had a lot more droppings laid, showing that the insects were also eating more. And this was done with this fairly simple bioassay. So we had laboratory data that confirmed what we found in the field. Basically, this was a factor of something on the surface of these plants, and we wanted to investigate what that was. So I did some chemical analysis. And we found this kind of group of chemicals, they're long chain esters of hydroxycinamic esters. esters. At this point here, the R2, we've got a long chain of chemicals. That, oops, sorry, I'm rushing ahead. Um, a long chain of uh, a long chain alcohol attached here. But most of the biological activity occurs at this point here. And the most interesting chemicals we found were these caffeic acid derivatives, the hexadecyl, the heptadecyl, and the octadecyl caffeic acid. So this was the chemical we found on the root surface of these resistant varieties. And we looked, at a few, uh, we looked at a broad range of some of these varieties to get an idea of the spread of this chemical. So we found this chemical in much greater concentrations on the resistant varieties and much lower concentrations on the susceptible varieties. And in fact, in Tanzania and NASPOT 1, we found none of this chemical on the root surface. So we've got resistant varieties, we've got susceptible varieties, and we've got a chemical that coincides with those uh, attributes. So we needed to find out if that chemical was having this effect. So we synthesized it in the laboratory, and we went back to our biological assay. We placed some of this chemical on the root surface of NASPOT1, which was the susceptible variety, and we managed to make it resistant by placing this chemical that occurs in the resistant variety on the susceptible variety, NASPOT1. We placed one female insect in each of these with the chemical and showed that the feeding and the, uh, the egg laying is much less in here. And I'll show you the data for that in this next dendrogram. So in the control, where no chemical was placed, we had a large number of feeding holes, and where we placed this particular chemical, we had many fewer feeding holes. We had far fewer droppings, and we had no eggs. So we're absolutely certain this chemical is produced by the plant to protect itself against this insect. So it's now up to us to try and exploit this. And what we're now doing is looking at a cross between the resistant variety that we found and a US susceptible variety called Bone Regard. And we now have 287 progeny in the F1 generation, and we're screening these for chemical variations and resistance that correspond to quantitative trait loci. Now we're using this variety because it's been completely mapped by North Carolina State University. So we're able to exploit this mapping and add it to this mapping, pop, this mapping information for dry matter, flesh colour, and sweet potato virus disease resistance. So hopefully in a year's time, we'll also have the markers for weevil resistance and be able to pile all these QTLs into one cultivar. And so use that ability of plants to defend themselves using their chemistry to improve our agriculture. Now there's one problem with plants producing chemicals to defend themselves against pests. They may also turn up in other parts of the plant that we don't want them to turn up in. Now this is work I'm going to briefly talk about which Sarah has been involved with, where we've been looking at the Andean lupin, a beautiful plant here, and unusually it's an important legume crop in the Andes, the high Andes. Um, it's a very important source of protein. But the beans contain harmful, harmful quinolizidine alkaloids, and these need to be removed before you eat it, otherwise they're toxic to people. Uh, they have to actually suck them up and put them in uh, running streams for about three or four days to extract all these alkaloids. So the problem that we face from an ecological point of view is that the chemistry isn't only in these beans, it's in all parts of the plant. And this includes the pollen. Now this is a plant that's pollinated by a bumblebee, a bombus species, and it contains these chemicals, lupinine and other derivatives based on hydroxylation at this 13 position. Um, so the main alkaloids of these compounds, they're plant defense compounds, much like the ones I found in sweet potato, uh, and they're toxic and repellent to aphids, which is great, because we don't get any aphids on these plants. But we were interested to know if these chem chemicals also had effects on the pollinators. We found the chemicals to be also present in the lupin and pollen, and so we wanted to see what these effects were. So Sarah set up these bioassays using what we call microcolonies. We get colonies of bumblebees 
Uh, we use Bombus terrestris as a model pollinator, although Bombus species do pollinate lupins in Europe and in South America. <clears throat> she made microcolonies, which effectively you, you separate out the total colony into four different parts and you remove the queen. So the queen is microcolonies, but they're useful for these bioassays. And we monitor the production of different sexes, their weight and mortality over a sustained period of time. And these are the kind of boxes that Sarah runs these bioassays in, they're homemade boxes. The first thing we found was that there was no significant effect of lupinine on bee mortality, which was a great relief. So that the amounts of lupinine that are being produced by lup lupins are not killing the bees, which is a great thing to find. However, we did find that when you get to ecologically relevant concentrations of lupinine in the pollen, we start to see some serious effects on colony fitness. And this shows here that with no lupinine in the pollen, you get um, about four uh, male individuals produced over this period of time. And as you increase the concentration of lupinine, to ecologically relevant concentrations, about one mg per gram of pollen, you get half the number of males produced. So these colonies are producing far fewer males, which must have some impact on colony fitness. Um, so we looked a little bit further at, um, at these males, and we found that not only were fewer males produced, but as you increase the concentration of lupinine, the actual size of the males decreases too. So lupinine in the pollen is making these colonies produce fewer males and smaller males. And so we need to consider what impacts these are going to have on the ecosystem if this is a long-term exposure. So sex ratios in bumblebees are typically in favour of males. More males are produced. And so the competition and access to females is obviously an important issue. If, he, if the, the males are, are weakened or if their fitness is compromised, then it may mean that the female won't even accept a male. So they may never get mated. And of course, as Sarah says, your fitness is really um, assessed by the success of your grandchildren, not your children. So if you're producing fit males that can't reproduce for you, then there's no point in producing those males. So these fitness questions are very serious. We're not too sure exactly what will happen if all the colonies start to produce fewer males. But it's a very interesting problem and something that needs to be considered when natural resistance is used in crop production. But of course, pollinators are a more um, friendly creature, and I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing about understanding how pollinators actually choose food. And again, it's about what chemicals the plants are producing to make them have these behaviours. So bees learn to choose flowers with the best reward. We know that they'll remember flower odors that have good sources of food as well. They often become florally constant. Uh, they temporarily specialize on flowers of one species. And they do this because there are mechanisms that plants employ to garner this pollinator fidelity. And we've got one very interesting example here that I wanted to speak to you about today. So just to kind of take this point a little step further, some plant flowers have very specialized mechanisms of only making their nectar available to one or two species. And this is aconitum. It's got a very peculiar nectary that only long um, proboscis and large, bum uh, large bees like bumblebees can reach. So this means it has fewer species pollinating it, which means those species are more likely to visit this species the next time they feed. So the pollen isn't getting taken to other species, it's getting taken to the same species, so the pollen is getting used, used usefully. So this is about the process of floral constancy that the plants want to employ to make sure their pollen is taken to a worthwhile um, uh, location. In this particular example, the nectar also produces a comity, which is toxic to nectar thieves. So it's a double mechanism, and we believe that bumblebees are resistant to this toxin. So it is another way that the flower uh, conserves that nectar for that one pollinator. We know that nectar contains other very interesting compounds. So for example, Nicotiana, the tobacco family, some species contain nicotine in the nectar. There are some examples, there are some examples of why that is that's associated with uh, um, a feeding deterrency. So we looked at the content of the nectar of citrus and coffee flowers. 
and we found um, we found caffeine in the citrus uh, and coffee species. We looked at all these different species of citrus and all these different species of coffee, and we found caffeine in all of them. Okay, now I feel a little bit better. Okay, so uh, let me just recap. So. We're interested in the chemicals that plants produce in caffeine, uh, in, in nectar. And of course, most of us are aware that nectar is a very strong sugar solution. There are also amino acids in there, so it's a very important form of food for bees and other pollinators. So we found um, caffeine produced in coffee and citrus flower nectar, which is kind of interesting. Uh, why might they do that? And I can say that actually it was almost unique as a, as a secondary metabolite in the nectar, whereas the flower contains lots of other chemicals. It was almost like it had been put there on purpose by the plant. Um, and in fact, in ca Coffea conifera, which is the robusta type coffee, we found concentrations that were not far off what you'd expect to find in a typical cup of coffee, which is kind of interesting. But we found this range of concentrations in the nectar of coffee species and also citrus species. And this work is just currently in press um, at the moment. This whole story is just in press. So what does caffeine do to bees? Why is it in the nectar? Um, well, we think we now know. And this was our first supposition. Caffeine is actually a feeding deterrent to, to insects, quite a strong feeding deterrent. So we thought, well, why is, it in the ca why is it in the nectar? Why would you provide a feeding deterrent to pollinators when you want them to feed? Um, so we did some bioassays ourselves, and we found that it is also a feeding deterrent to bees, but only above about 0.1 millimolar. So you can see here, this is the response of the mouth parts to caffeine, and even the antenna show at high concentrations a response to caffeine. So caffeine is a feeding deterrent to bees, but it never occurs at higher concentrations than this. So in the nectar, it's never a feeding deterrent to bees, so it must have some other purpose. So we used our expertise in memory evaluation in bees at Newcastle University, one of our collaborators. We conducted what are called conditioning trials where you present a good food source for the bees with a flower odour. So they become uh, trained to associate that flower odour with that food source. And what bees do when they detect a flower odour that they perceive as associated with food is they extend their proboscis. And this is called the proboscis extension reflex. It's actually used by um, people who are looking for drugs and explosives in bags as well. It's a very sophisticated process of learning and memory in bees that's very reliable. So we use this proboscis extension reflex. We used an approximation to the coffee and citrus flower nectar, about 0.7 molar sucrose, and we added caffeine at naturally relevant concentrations that we would get in the nectar, and we trained them for a flower odour and tested their memory of the floral scent after 10 minutes, which is a short-term interval, and after 24 hours the next day. And this was the data that we found. At low concentrations, or in fact in the absence of, in the, sorry, in the absence of caffeine, the memory after 24 hours is very poor compared to the memory after 10 minutes. But as you increase the concentration, the memory improves. And when you get up to this concentration, you actually have the same memory after 24 hours for that flower odour that you do uh, after 10 minutes. And these represent the concentrations we're finding in, ca in coffee and citrus flower nectar. So what we believe is that the plants are producing caffeine in the nectar so that the bees remember that flower smell and return to that flower smell because they know it's a source of food. So this is quite fascinating work, and as I say, it's currently in press in, for science for next week, if you want to check it out. But I just want to recap on why we think this is important. If bees are more likely to continue foraging on the same species over a longer period of time, e.g. E days, the bees are much more likely to confuse, uh, much less likely, sorry, to confuse other plant species with similar signals. Okay, so they're going to be returning to that same species. And of course, bees are more likely also to recruit other nest mates to forage on that species too, if their memory of the reward is good. So what we've got is bees who are laden with pollen, feeding on one species, 
who the next day, still laden with pollen, are going to that same species. So that pollen is making the transfer from one flower to another. And that is being secured about three times more effectively than if there was no caffeine in the nectar. So ultimately, this leads to greater fitness. So finally, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some of the work that's currently going on with the University of Trinidad and Tobago that relates in some ways to some of the work I've talked about, certainly to pollinators. Um, it's called the COCO POP Project. Uh, this stands for COCO Pollination for Optimised Production. Uh, it's a new ACP funded project that's led by Denise Thompson at the University of Trinidad and Tobago. And our project partners are the Cocoa Industry Board in Jamaica, the uh, CABI in Trinidad, and of course the Natural Resources Institute in the United Kingdom. Now, cocoa pollination has been studied uh, but a long time ago. Um, many cocoa cultivars are at least partly dependent on. Um, pollinators, particularly those that are outcrossing, this requires pollen transfer from one tree to another. You also get self-compatible types, but these also need a pollinator visitor to, in, to get that pollen from the male parts to the female parts. And this is all insect mediated. And the understanding is, you can see here we've got a photograph of some cocoa flowers, and if you can take this little red circled area here, you'll see a tiny little um, smudge here. I've tried to expand that up and what you can see here is a species of midge that is believed to be the main pollinator for cocoa. So this is uh, a very unusual plant in that it's not pollinated by bees or birds or bats but it's pollinated by midges. Most of the, most of the pollination in cocoa is thought to be done by this group um, of diptera, the Ceratopogonidae and particularly species in the genus Forsyth and Maya. And we have some examples of this very tiny insect here. But there may also be contributions from other diptera, particularly the Cicidomyidae, which are the gormages. And the importance of this group may come clear over the next few minutes as I illustrate some of the work that we've been carrying out already. So our theory is this. If we can better understand what pollination, um, the pollination ecology or the pollination mechanism is, perhaps we can improve pollination. And if we can improve pollination, can we improve the yields? Obviously, the limitations on cocoa production um, in the Caribbean, at least, are limited by land. Um, in other parts of the world, it's possible perhaps to spread. But if we can improve yields and make it more profitable here, then perhaps it will help to reinvigorate the industry. But does boosting pollination uh, actually boost yield? Well, it depends on the location. There are different schools of thought. Um, some work shows significant increases, but other work is a little bit more equivocal. So there is a kind of a mixed feeling about whether we're going to be able to actually improve pollination yield. And also, uh, is it actually sustainable? There is some thought that if you um, increase, increase pollination and increase production, uh, too effectively, you're actually compromising the tree and you'll have, then have a period of time afterwards where the tree isn't able to actually produce very much yield. So we need to fully understand what the implications are. Um, we also have this situation where um, Shirel Wilt may limit production as well. If you have too many fruits or pods on a tree, they're dropped. And that's the, the, certainly the belief. Although, having said that, uh, fruit abortion isn't unique to cocoa. It happens in a, in a lot of fruit producing trees, but it isn't always because they've got too many fruit on them. It might be because the pollination has been inadequate. So this is another thing we're going to try and look at during the course of this project. So current project activities, the project's only a few months old, but we've managed to collect some very interesting data already. Um, Sarah Arnold, who's been doing most of the insect trapping, has managed to use two main processes for trapping insects. This is a suction trap which we've got out of a cocoa field and a malaise trap here. The malaise trap works on the basis that insects will fly underneath and be trapped up in here, and this just simply sucks them out of the air at about flower height. Um, actually, this is collecting a lot of larger insects. It's not actually that efficient as a tool. So we're going to depend much more on this process. And what we're going to try and do is assess the insect diversity in cocoa plantations across 
um, across Trinidad and hopefully Jamaica to see what kind of insects are around and which, um, which might be other pollinators. So just to have a quick look at this suction trap, essentially insects are sucked in through the top here. There's a, um, air is drawn down through here by a, a simple computer fan, a cooling fan from a computer that's, that's fixed to the bottom, and they're drawn into this collecting uh, device which has got ethanol in it. So as soon as they land in here, they're killed, and we can collect them and look at look, um, look what we've collected uh, later. Um, and rather handily, it runs off a 12 volt or a car battery, so we can have these set up in all different parts without being connected to the electricity. Uh, the preliminary results are already quite interesting. Uh, we're getting a variety of insects, Diptera, Hymenoptera and Coleoptera. Uh, Diptera is the, uh, um, is the order where we'd expect to find images. Um, but we're actually finding very few of the Ceratopagology, which is the um, grouping of insects that we're expecting to find the, uh, the well-known cocoa, co cocoa midge, or the cocoa midge that we expect to find. And just to look a little bit in some detail at some of the data we're getting, um, in these suction traps, this is what we're collecting in shade, um, and this is a spread of the different groups of insects that we're collecting, uh, the different orders of insects. The uh, Ceratopagonidae, uh, which, in which we find the cocoa midge, are here. In fact, if I use this little clever device, you'll see that uh, actually this has already been done for me. Um, the most abundant um, order of insects that we're um, that we're finding, or subfamily, uh, superfamily of insects we're finding, is the Cynomyde, and these are gall midges, and they were by far the most abundant species that we found. Whereas the grouping of insects that we really wanted to find were the Ceratopagonidae, and we found hardly any, and this was in shade. And we took the same uh, collection process to uh, sunny areas, uh, so non-shade areas, and we found very similar results. The bulk of the insects are from the gall midge um, or non-biting midges, uh, and in fact, in this particular case, we found uh, absolutely no Ceratopagonidae. In fact, from that collection, which was in November, out of 800 insects that we sampled, less than four hmm. were cocoa midges. Which is interesting, because, of course, the cocoa midge is the thing that's doing the pollination. Well, at least that's what all the literature says. So we are faced with a very interesting situation here. So just to give you some idea of the kind of traps that we've used uh, and which is the most effective, you can see here suction traps are catching the kind of insects that we would expect to be doing pollinating if any of these insects were able to do it. But again, it doesn't feature the Ceratopagonidae. Uh, Malaise traps were catching other um, uh, groups and pan traps, we also had these pan traps on the ground which were really collecting insects that were just in the, in the, in the leaf litter, but not Ceratopagonidae. So this is a really interesting situation. We've basically got a situation where we've got none, or almost none, of the cocoa pollinating midges in cocoa fields. However, we are getting cocoa pods. So we can only assume something else is pollinating the cocoa. We need to find out what that is. There's plenty of fruit set in this particular um, station where we've been collecting the insects. So we're wondering about other groups that may be pollinating, particularly figuring out how important the gall midge group are for pollinating. And this is important, of course, because if cultural practices, farming practices, favour environments for forcing the mire or the ceratopagonidae, then maybe they're not needed if something else is actually doing the pollinating. And maybe we need to think about changing practices to suit other pollinators. We don't know yet, but this is a possibility. We've been sampling in three locations on this current visit, um, down in Grand Coover um, and uh, also nearer here in Omira, and we're still finding the same groupings of insects and virtually no ceratopagonidae. So one other area of work that we've been um, employing is looking at the smells of these cocoa flowers to try and figure out how important flower smells are for attracting the right midge or the wrong midge uh, and the most efficient uh, pollinator. So this is a rather unflattering picture of me up a tree um, setting up this bag and what this device here does, it blows cleaned air into a plastic bag that's tied around a branch with flowers and then it sucks out the odour from the flowers. So what I'm able to do is I'm able to trap the plant odours on a special filter that's in here and we take this back to the UK and we analyse it by GCMS, gas chromatography mass spectrometry, and we're trying to find out what the smells are in these flowers. Now there was some earlier work on this where they used steam distillation to get some of these plant odours 
It's not a very efficient mechanism, but of course at the time it was probably all they had available to them. And they identified um, one pentadecene and one heptadecene and some high molecular weight hydrocarbons. And this was the structure that they thought they'd had. Interestingly, the people that did this work found that these chemicals, or at least the steam distillate from the flower, was actually attractive to sicidomides uh, midges. These are the gall midges. And it wasn't attractive to the ceratophagonids. So the flower smells that they were collecting were not actually attractive to the insect that we all expect to be doing the pollination. So we took our own samples back to the UK from our last trip in November, and we did some analysis, and we found actually many more chemicals um, in the odour than had been found previously. And what we think actually is that the previous analysis, uh, limited by the, um, the facilities they had at the time, was actually probably not right. And what we found is um, <coughs> what we found is that the uh, the chemicals, although similar were slightly different in that the double bond was actually in the middle of the molecule. And this is actually very significant because it will make a very big difference to what biological activity that chemical has. And so what we've now done is we've made an artificial blend of some of these compounds, uh, an artificial flower smell, if you will, and we've got it out in the field at the moment to see what we're attracting. Uh, we've actually set them up down in Grand Couver. And in fact, yesterday, we did go down and we found that we were attracting quite a lot of thrips, uh, as well as other gormages. But as yet, we've again found no um, cocoa images. Um, so it's a kind of interesting situation that we find ourselves here in. Um, but obviously, there's lots of questions still to ask. Um, so here's an example of the traps that we've been using to try and see if this smell actually works. This is the trap that's most successful. It's called the Delta Trap. This is a sticky um, substance here. And we can hang the flower smell from a, um, a unit just above here. Um, this malaise, uh, sorry, this little fail trap has not been very successful. But this is a process that we've been using to see what um, the volatile blend of the flowers is attracted to. So, so that's what we've got to so far with this project. So it's only been going a few months, but we've also we've, we've managed to ask a few interesting and perhaps difficult questions. Uh, what is actually pollinating cocoa in Trinidad? And if it's not that, if it's not uh, the cocoa midge, then what is it? Um, so what other activities are we going to try and um, get out of this current project? We're, we're interested in mass rearing, whatever the midges that we want to, um, that we want to pollinate the, the cocoa plants with. As yet, we don't know exactly which midge is the most important one, but once we do, we'll begin the process of mass rearing so we can do more sophisticated experiments. Uh, we also want to perhaps look at natural augmentation of pollinators, consider current practices and perhaps whether or not there needs to be some change. Uh, is there any scope for artificial augmentation, mass release at certain times of the year when um, the trees are most receptive to pollinators? And finally, monitor effects on fruit set, uh, including manipulative experiments, to see what happens if we improve pollination. Do you get more seeds in a pot, for example? So the project has a website, and you can follow all the activities um, here at www.cocopop.eu, and we'll update this as and when things come, ar um, come around. Um, and this will be our process for publicity, publications, and dissemination. And um, with that, I'd just like to acknowledge the staff who have been involved in all of the work I've presented today, both at the University of Greenwich, and of course the UTT staff, CABI staff, and COCA Research Section staff who have been involved in the work on cocoa pollination, and other collaborators associated with work I was talking about earlier in this seminar. Geraldine Wright and Annie Borland of Newcastle, and Robert Weinger and Harriet McGinza of Macquarie University. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening and ask any questions. Okay, question. Yes. Uh, I have a few clarifications, starting from the back and going forward. We worked with the steam distillate. Mm. Where was this done? Uh, Katia, I think. Okay. Now, you, when you did your GC mass spec work, mm. you discovered that what they thought they had in the steam distillate, they didn't have. They had mm. a slightly different compound. Mm. Uh, but the information that what they did have, whatever it was, mm. attracted the gormages, mm -hmm. that is still true. Yes. Okay. Yeah, the thing Did is, they, they made a steam distillate, right. and they used that steam distillate right. 
to attract the gourmetges. I'm so assuming they, they, they collected this from Coco. But, well, yeah, so it was actually cocoa from our smell. Right. Uh, so it's just we think they got the chemical wrong. So this is all right, but this is also sort of an independent bit of proof that the literature, um, the literature uh, comment that it is cocoa midges that are in fact pollinated cocoa. I thought that Trinidad, much as Trinidad, is different in many other respects mm -hmm. from your talk there. It was simply different in which midge mm -hmm. pollinated it. But that bit of research with the steam distillates mm -hmm. seems to indicate, regardless of what the compound was, it doesn't really matter. What matters is, is that it was the odors of cocoa flowers mm -hmm. in that area. And, they were and it midges. attracted gore midges yeah. and not cocoa midges. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you, you clarified what it was so you could make a little cocktail, but the basic conclusion that it was attracting a different image from what is articulated in the literature is interesting. Um, I wanted to find out, how did you test the memory of the bumblebee in that experiment you did between uh, 10 minutes and 24 hours? I know you said they extend their proboscis when they get a scent, but how did you test the memory? Well, if you uh, if you present um, if you if you train bees mm -hmm. to uh, associate a flower odor with a food source, they will um, learn to expect a food source right. when they receive that flower odor. Right. So, so if you provide the really food source, so, just the yeah, exactly. So if you provide just the odor, they will extend their proboscis, what, yeah. thinking, ah, oh, oh, there's some it's food coming. Really and so after 10 minutes, actually they're just, good at, they're just good at remembering because it's actually not a very long period of time that's gone yeah. past. But over 24 hours, and in fact 72 yeah. hours, mm -hmm. we've shown that they're able to remember much more effectively. And in fact what I didn't tell you was the, that we've even bathed bees' brains in caffeine and show, shown that caffeine acts as an adenosine antagonist in the uh, mushroom bodies of Kenyan cells, which is effectively the part of the brain that is responsible for uh, long-term memory in bees. So we do think we've got an actual pharmacological effect going on here. The caffeine is actually making the, the brain uh, more receptive to learning. Um, well, just out of curiosity, how did you detect that? Pet Well, you can use electrophysiology to detect what's going on in certain neurons in the brain. And you can use other chemicals to reciprocate the kind of effects that you're getting with caffeine so what is and show that it's a damage. Scan or something? What? No, 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 it's just electro it's an electrophysiological response. You'll, you'll basically record um, the, the difference before and after um, adding the caffeine to the, to the, okay. to the brain. So there's no PET scan. Um, yeah. I was also a little bit curious about the cluster analysis you did, the okay. analysis you generated the dendrogram. Mm -hmm. um, what variables did you put in that? Okay, yeah. I mean obviously I've tried to cover so much. I, yeah. If I'd been talking about each of these subjects in, um, on their own, I would have tried to kind yeah. of incorporate Not a lot more detail. But we, we included um, stem damage, um, root damage. Um, we also included uh, weight loss as a, as a consequence of that damage. So if you had, if you could look at the surface of a root and see they were sort of 30 uh, feeding punctures from a weevil, we then looked through the root to see actually whether that led to a lot more damage internally. So we had several components that we had combined to produce the dendrogram. So it was basically based on levels of damage and the kind of damage that these plants were suffering from in the field. Okay, um, because uh, when you broke it into clusters, which I, I thought just your cluster solution was reasonable, but um, I got a little bit turned around because uh, it seems as if you identified these, the different um, flowers as being resistant or susceptible after the cluster analysis, but surely that was known before. No, what we did, we did a field trial, uh -huh. and then we infested those with insects in the field, right. and then from that we were able to say, right, this cultivar is, is, is resistant, this one's right. acceptable, this one's tolerant. Yeah. Right. From looking at them? No, yeah, just from assessing exactly. the damage. But of course, in, in the field, sweet potatoes have certain characteristics. Some of them are deep-rooted, yeah. some of them are shallow-rooted. If they're shallow-rooted, then that often leads to cracking on the surface, which makes it much more easy for insects to get to them. So if you've got a deep-rooted variety, it might actually be avoiding infestation rather than actually being resistant. 
So we wanted to take it to the laboratory mm -hmm. to make sure that we had a mechanism that was a chemical-based one um, associated with the root surface rather than simply the roots being, say, deep-rooted so that they never crack the surface to enable the weevils to get down there in the first place. Because typically that's how weevils kind of get down. In fact, if you have deep-rooted varieties, you can avoid infestation. And in fact, healing up is one of the most important ways of preventing insects getting to your sweet potato. So you were just using the test analysis to reaffirm yeah. your, your visual inspection yeah. because I couldn't, I couldn't follow yeah. the need for the cluster analysis. I mean, okay. it makes a good picture, but I couldn't see why it would be necessary when your visual inspection would have told you what was resistant. Well, it was a way of combining all of that data. Yeah. It meant I didn't have to show you five different figures. I just showed you one figure. Mm -hmm. And I guess you could also find the, the common denominators chemically in those plants. Mm -hmm. One last question, and okay. what do you mean by quantitative trait to look I well, know that you said the QTS, you let down, but I couldn't follow what you know, so you if you, if you effectively, to, if, if you excuse my crude phraseology, if you chop up your DNA into mm -hmm. different components, yeah. you can associate um, certain parts with certain traits. Yes, we call them quantitative trait load guys because they're associated with quantitative traits being um, not present or absent, but present at different um, levels. Okay, right. So, so right. you wouldn't typically have, say, an orange fleshed or a not orange fleshed. There would be Which some be something okay. in between. So it's right. a quantitative trait. Right. So, yes. It's a trait that occurs at lots of different I levels. See. Yes, I've never heard okay. that before. Yes. Thank it's you. A, okay. so that's what it is. Anyone else got any questions? Um, just a couple of comments as we go along. Um, some of us may be thinking of in the various programs opportunities for both undergraduate or graduate projects coming off of this. It's an entrepreneurial university and Professor Stevenson did talk about the business opportunities in terms of the commercialization of some of these processes as we identify which midges are actually doing the pollinating then is it possible for us to mass rear and develop colonies of these midges if we move from SA to SA like they do with bees um, and opportunities for sustainable businesses from that kind of activity. But there are significant opportunities for undergraduate and graduate projects as well that we'd be happy to talk with, mm -hmm. talk with different programs as to some of the systems, um, physical systems for doing this or other kinds of um, um, yeah. We need all the help we can get, actually. So graduate, graduate students or undergraduate students, if there's anyone who wants to be involved, you know, we have Different plenty of work. Of the project. There are lots yeah. of things come to yeah. us, basically. Absolutely, absolutely. So thank you very much, sir, for yeah, the presentation. Right.